morning and welcome to the Think React Leads radio show. I'm your host, Dom Fawcett, executive coach and leadership speaker, here with you on Intelligent Talk 96 The Patriot, KKNT. Well, folks, first I want to say thank you, whether you know it or not, thank you for celebrating. Uh, today marks my fourth year. This is the day I, I, I walked away from uh, corporate. Now, for those of you that need a word of encouragement or you think that word is going to be the thing to say, you know what, Dom did it, I can do it, don't. If you need somebody to encourage you to walk away from your corporate job, it is not the time for you to leave. you got to do that on your own because uh, when feces hit the oscillating rotor, folks, you're going to be there by yourself and you're not going to, like, there's nobody else to cry on. There's no PTO. You know what? Let me make it sound nice. Working by your, for yourself is fun, like, 3% of the time. So understand what you're getting into before you do. But, man, it's been a journey. And speaking of journeys, so I've got a guest in studio and we're going to talk about, you know what, we're going to talk about a lot of great things. But let me share with you, the dude's resume is so, like, superfluous and out of this world. And he's very humble. I could just look at him and tell. But I'm going to go over some things. Let me let me share some things with you. In studio, I have Dave Klukey. Dave served over 20 years in the U.S. Army Special Forces Green Berets. He spent more than five years deployed to combat and other global operational assignments in a variety of leadership positions from commanding a Special Forces A-Team, so the real A-Team, and Special Forces Company in combat to overseeing highly sensitive U.S. global counterterrorism initiatives. Dave's awards include the Legion of Merit. They don't just hand those out, fo hand those out folks. Five Bronze Star Medals, Special Forces tab, Ranger tab, Combat Diver Badge, and numerous other U.S. and foreign decoration and awards. And the, the list goes on, but... I met a guy during jujitsu, and he's like, man, this dude is a VA. Like, I've never met him, but if I, you got to connect with him because he's a local guy. Now, the guy that I'm sparring with is also a Green Beret. So when a Green Beret says another dude, another Green Beret is that dude, you got to get him on the show. So, Dave, I just want to say thank you very much for uh, coming on the show. Greatly appreciate that, and here you are. Here I am. Here you are. So, just, just so the audience knows... What is a Green Beret? This is great. So um, I hear this question a lot, mostly in bars. <laughs> and, um, so is Green Beret like a ranger? Well, no. We're, we're a little bit different. And uh, as you know, the Army is the largest, really, component of all our armed services. And within each one, there's special operations forces. And But Green Berets have the honor of having their identity mistaken all the time in media. So everything is special forces. Mm -hmm. Well, wrong. Media got it wrong. <laughs> uh, that's special operations forces. So let's talk about the only special forces there are, and that's Green Berets. And what makes us different than everybody else? Well, uh, it comes down to mission, it comes down to language, and it comes down to really uh, the selection process and how folks are employed. And it's really the only arsenal in the U.S. military that specializes in unconventional warfare. And unconventional warfare, what is it? Well, simply put, take 12 people on a Special Forces 18, just 12, mm -hmm. put them into a foreign country, and we could probably take over that country for you. Uh, that's how we work. We're force multipliers. Uh, we're moving into a very uncertain area, uncertain situation, hostile-type right. environment, very non-permissive, develop critical relationships do a very detailed assessment to develop an understanding of that area, and slowly over time, and sometimes quickly, believe it or not, okay. uh, develop both the security, which is the armed faction, uh, the government, uh, so stand up governments based on who the local power brokers and influencers are. They may not be the ones you want to check or put in power, Correct. so you've got to make that assessment as well, and then finally development, developing those uh, capabilities of that government over time, um, you know, not only infrastructure but also their military capabilities. Right. So, only force in DoD that does it culturally astute, language capable. It's a requirement. So within this two years of training, Green Berets have to learn a language. What language did you learn? I learned French. I got over. It. <laughs> <laughs> and, Are you assigned that, or do you pick it? Uh, it's based off the regional affiliation of a special forces group. Okay. So there's five active duty groups and two national guard, and each group has an area of the world. Like for example, first group has Asia. Okay. So they spend a lot of time in the Philippines and the archipelago they have there. Uh, you know, third group where I'm from, we're historically Africa or you know West Africa. 
Oh, that makes sense. Okay. And they changed it up, and that's why I learned French, is because of that West African focus. Mm -hmm. And of course, 9 11 happened, and Third Group found itself <laughs> pretty much in charge of Afghanistan. Not speaking Africa. French. Yeah, no, no French. <laughs> right. There. A lot of Pashtun, Dari, Urdu, you name it. So Now, did you, did you plan as a kid to be a Green Beret? No, I had no idea. My dad was Air Force, so uh, I knew I wanted to go in the Army, right. and, but I didn't have a... I, and ironically, Fort Devens, I grew up in Massachusetts okay. originally, and Fort Devens was right there, and that was 10 Special Forces Group. I had no idea. I liked the tanks, I liked to play around and jump in the pond. Knew I wanted to go in the Army, had really no idea what Special Forces was back then. So you joined the Army, and, and what was your initial uh, role in the Army? So it's kind of funny. Um, my ROTC instructor was a cab guy, cavalry. Okay. So that's recon, and you know they have light cab and armored cab. And he sold me a bill of goods. I love him to death, <laughs> but he wanted to make sure that I went armor branch. And it's like you know, cab scouts are just like special forces. I'm like, <laughs> but not really. And I bought it hook, line, and sinker because I didn't know I was ignorant. And I was like, okay, I got to do that. That oh, we're ahead of enemy lines. We do all this cool stuff, and I'm like, that's what I want to do. Okay. Um, I was educated later, of course, uh, but you know, I, I found my way. And then from from there, did you get did you go into selection? What was the the, the process to? So the process for me is I, I ended up getting my first duty assignment was at Fort Carson, Colorado. And then, ironically, again, that's where 10 Special Forces Group moved to. So they, so they used to be at Fort Devens back in the day, and then they moved to Fort Carson along the way. And while I was there, before I even went there, uh, while I was in basic course, I ended up going to Ranger School, and I went to Airborne School as a cadet at Georgia Southern University. And I kind of was getting a clearer picture of what it was. That makes sense. And when I was in Bosnia, um, you know, this was back in 99 or 2000 time frame, and it was prior to 9-11, but we we're sitting in downtown Zvornik, which was on the border of Serbia and the Drina River, and this dude comes walking up, and, and back then we wore this battle dress uniform, BDUs, mm -hmm. like the, they're kind of like the uniforms they have now, they made sense, they're camouflage. Right. <laughs> and this guy comes walking up with his hands in his pockets, you know, totally slick, I'm buttoned up. I look like a character from Super Mario Brothers, like the bad guy, you know, like the turtle. I got a helmet on. I got right. this gigantic flak vest. He just comes walking. He's like, what's up, dude? I'm like, hi. <laughs> I could tell he was American, but this guy was so cool, calm, collected, knew the area, and I found out he's an SF guy uh, later. He was actually the detachment commander, the captain for the team. He was okay. cruising around that area. Just seeing what's like going on. Like he lives on. there. Yeah, which he does. Which he does. <laughs> right. totally lives there. They had uh, JCO houses or Joint Commission Officer mm -hmm. Observer houses back then, and you know they were helping out. But um, seeing that guy and seeing that autonomy and seeing mm -hmm. that confidence and really that thorough understanding of the operational environment where he was, and being able to cruise around the way he was, I was like, I want to be that guy. That, right. That, that is my new hero. <laughs> Absolutely. So you you. You found your, your, your way through uh, Green Berets, and, and you've had a very successful career from, as I'm looking at your, um, not your resume, but your bio. Is there, how do you get out and transfer two decades of, I'm going to call it running and gunning for lack of better words, like, how do you transfer that into civilian life? Yeah, that's a great question, and... You know, a lot of our Green Berets are extremely successful, and they do that transition and translate it well. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I was like, you know, I need to learn that foreign language of business mm -hmm. because I understand intuitively and through experience, you know, project management. You know, I, I didn't use like the waterfall lexicon or any right. of that, but I understood it. And so I'm like, wow, well, why don't I get an MBA and you know? start learning this foreign language of business and translating those skills so I understand how to better market and advertise those. Okay. And for me, that worked. Um, other guys, uh, it's relationships like anything else because, you know, businesses want to succeed and they want to hire people that will make their organizations better mm -hmm. and bring that value. The problem is, unfortunately, in many regards, um, when you look at the military holistically, everybody's great. Everybody in the military brings value. Everybody in the military brings work ethic. Green Berets, the top really 1%, you know, like all other special operations forces, bring a little bit more. And, and why do I say that? I say it because they're 
self-starters, they're comfortable working in ambiguity or you know, uncertainty. They can formulate plans. Planning and assessments are probably the two primary things that they can bring to the table. And it's just educating business leaders about that. Uh, because you know, when you look at the really the percentages, you have 1% of the US society serves right now. Just Correct. 1%, 7% have served. And within that 1%, you have like 0.1% <laughs> you that, that, that special operations forces and, and you know within that special forces. And you know it's translating that and educating the business leaders and you know gatekeepers about what people like me and others can bring to their organization, which is vast. Considering the US government relies on us to go on a said foreign country in a completely unfamiliar, uncertain <laughs> environment and then be that representative of the United States, that says something. And you have to understand the environment entirely and do that deep dive assessment. So it seems like it's it, you've, you've made the transition pretty easy going from being active duty into what I would consider business development. And yes, if you can establish uh, a country, I'm sure you could, in another country, like you can establish a business in the U.S. Do you ever find that it's, it's, it's harder to get people to see past your, the superhero effect that they have as they visually speak to you just so you can disseminate the effective information to grow their business? Do you find it hard to kind of break down the mysticism? You know, I, I actually, I never considered until I observed it firsthand. And it's funny. I mean, Hollywood helps in some regards. It's right. like, hey, you know, here's Arnold Schwarzenegger or whatever it may be. You do all these superhero type things. Yes, that's part of the mission. And kicking down a door and doing that clearing is really, like, if you can't do that, you don't even need to be on a team. That's, like, right. very low. What we do is more nuanced, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a thinking man's game. Okay. And that's where I think we bring the, the most value. I like that. The other stuff is great, but it's breaking down that door kicker type right. image that people have and understanding it's like we're warrior diplomats that's yeah. that's what we do uh, i think people forget that you guys are pretty intelligent most of us no you have to. <laughs> um, you know you'd be surprised but no but most of us in order to get in actually all of us in order to get in you have to have a high iq mm -hmm. and that's one of the discriminators okay and you know they'll they'll do a test an iq test they'll test you to make sure that you're not crazy mm -hmm. they'll do an emotional intelligence test on you and you know these folks are very high quality individuals and the physical fitness goes without saying. Uh, yeah, right, like you're not even gonna get past the, anything without the physical fitness. Now you you were in, and I brought this up in the previous segment, you were in for two decades. Yes. Uh, you saw a lot. I did. Uh, you see things that most of the world will never see outside of their yeah. video games and television. Um, but you're, you, you get out and you have to live what society would call a normal life. Um, have you had to deal with, or have you had soldiers that have had to deal with uh, PTS or, or, or TDI, and what's that look like for you? Both. Um, you know, you can't deploy and go to combat as much as I've gone um, and not have some kind of effect psychologically, mm -hmm. right? I, I, I mean, I'd probably be a sociopath if I didn't. Right. Um, so one of the things for me, um, I, I was textbook. I first experienced it probably seeing the mass grave sites in Bosnia when they were exhumed and smelling that horrible smell mm -hmm. um, and seeing children with hands and feet down. I mean, they were executed wholesale and this right. is back, you know, genocide mm -hmm. in, in Bosnia. Um, but it didn't manifest itself until after probably my first combat deployment in 2004 and then I had stacked. Uh, I was literally in Afghanistan every year. Uh, 04, 05, 06, 07, 08, 11, 12, 13, and 14, and then I was actively involved in 15 and 16 in other ways. Okay. Um, and it, it was a lot. So, and, and they stacked on themselves, but retrospectively, I was textbook PTS. And I got blown up uh, in 2004 in an mm -hmm. IED incident in a soft skin vehicle. Uh, it was a deep seated IED, so that means they, they put it deep in the soil. And right. the soil there in Afghanistan is very much like here in Arizona, where <laughs> a lot it's of like rock. cement. Right, exactly. <laughs> so hard. Uh, so we were lucky that the, the soil uh, absorbed the brunt of the blast and mm -hmm. didn't just vaporize us. Uh, we were thrown way in the air and landed. 
Um, but you know, through explosive breaching, uh, bad airborne landings, hitting your head, uh, there's just a lot. So TBI, I didn't even know it was in my records. I didn't find out until I was doing my VA Got, okay. <laughs> assessment. Okay. And it was in there numerous times. I was like, oh, okay. So, uh, and then the PTS, I think I lived in denial for the better half of, well, well over a decade. Because uh, like I said, I came back in 04, and if you could be a camera or a fly in the wall and observe my behavior at home and at work, two different things. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd have my slip ups at home, made my let my wife's life a living hell. Right. Um, and then I didn't actively seek treatment until much later. First, I had to admit that I had a problem. Correct. And you know, for folks that are super A type personalities that want to problem solve and want to not have an issue, that was the first struggle. First, admitting, hey, I, I have an issue. Um, and the second part was in which was really difficult was actually actively seeking help. That's hard. It's hard. It's very hard. Yeah. And I'll tell you from personal experience, um, you know, not all providers are created equal. Mm -hmm. And sometimes folks will get turned off because the provider will not understand them. They won't resonate with them and they'll feel like they're banging their head up against the wall. And here they are just making themselves vulnerable to seek help and the, the provider may not get it. It took me five providers to get finally get just a diagnosis, no treatment at this point. Right. This is over a two year time period. Now, just for people that are listening and, and maybe you're that one person uh, that, that has a negative experience with the VA, I can tell you from personal experience that you can ask to change Absolutely. your psychiatrist. Um, it took me seven times walking to the VA doors before the seventh time I went in. And it was the seventh time where the day before my wife looked at me and said, I, I don't, I'm not afraid of you. I'm afraid for you. Oh, wow. And this was last year. So it took, it, it, it took me 15 years to acknowledge it. And then another three to, could you get to the door and you see somebody with their legs gone? And you're like, eh, I'm gonna let him have my slot. So what, what, it. what did you do? Like once you, once you acknowledged it within self, and said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and make this change. So I'd like to, I'd like to profess that it was clean and, and beautiful like that. And I had this, <laughs> never had this self-actualization, <laughs> this epiphany that drove me to this. Right. Uh, but the, the ugly truth is I became a complete sugar honey iced tea show, like living a double life um, in front of everybody, I'm presenting well, I'm professional. I'm oh, we're good at that. On, wearing a mask, right? <laughs> right. Um, and then at home or, you know, when I'm alone, here I am doing these risky activities and behaviors, speeding, drinking, using <laughs> alcohol as a, a coping mechanism, but a very bad coping mechanism to excess and becoming literally a nightmare for, for my wife and kids. Um, and I basically, it was about a year after my retirement, and I'm still in the MBA program at this time, and I had a, a, a huge incident. and. It was bad, and my wife is like, you know what? She gave me some tough love. She's like, you know what? You and I, so it was a it was a combination of my wife and it was also friends. Mm -hmm. So they kind of had like a classic intervention. Right. And they're like, look, you're gonna stay with me, my buddy. He's he's hilarious. He he sounded like a WWF wrestler, and we were sitting out on my back porch, like. Look, brother, you're gonna right. come stay with him. Like Hulk Hogan, <laughs> it's right. hilarious. But at, at the time, I'm like, this is surreal. So I ended up uh, finding a place for me that worked. It was called Warrior's Heart, and ended up being a 42 day program, literally life changing for mm -hmm. me. Uh, earned my way back home. Earned it every day. Uh, but you know, when when folks talk about PTS and TBI and overcoming it and all this kind of stuff, yes, that is true but it's a lifetime struggle. These are things that you have to do, you have to take care of yourself. Uh, so it's it doesn't just go away, it gets way, way, way better. You can struggle well and flourish, mm -hmm. but you also have to take a concerted effort to take care of yourself to do that. When we come back from break, I wanna talk about two things. One, um, what what it looks like on the other side of better, yeah. but before we do that, the the mask that we wear, we're so good, and I'm not lumping my experience into yours, but when you have this PTS, you become so good of masking it that your your family oftentimes doesn't realize how deep it is. And you said you we get better, and we're gonna talk about that. And just, I'm gonna ask you a question, we'll answer when we come back from break. Do you think it gets worse, like once you acknowledge it, do you think it get worse, gets worse before it gets, before it gets better? So hold, hold the answer to that 
question. And folks, um, if you have anybody that is near you or that you know that's, and you don't have to be a veteran to have to deal with PTS or TBI, um, tag them, make them come to the show because what we're gonna, what we're talking about, um, I'm going to say is life changing. Um, because you you might not know what that person's going through, what they've gone through, because you're probably not ready to hear everything, um, and they're just not comfortable sharing it with you. So do you think it gets worse before it gets better? Let's talk about that. Oh, absolutely. It gets it gets way worse. Mm -hmm. um, and you know the hardest thing is actually facing your demons and, mm -hmm. and seeing them and thinking about it because the whole time you got it, you're you're suppressing. Oh yeah, and you're, Every you're day. just trying to push it down inside. Everything's okay. I'm good until you're not. And you know when when you're dealing with it and actually experiencing it again, uh, one of the biggest things that I struggled with uh, when I was really bad with uh, PTS was having any type of emotion. Emotion's bad. Feeling is terrible. Yeah, you're a man. Yeah. Embrace the suck. Embrace it. Uh, <laughs> keep it all inside until you spontaneously go up. Right. Until exactly. so you're doing 180 miles an hour on the freeway on a Wednesday at noon with your motorcycle. But on the break, you brought up EMDR. And, man, um, let's talk about that. I'll tell you that while at Warrior's Heart, because um, I, I tried therapy, I tried everything else, and nothing was working for me. Um, Tried the EMDR and I was suspect like everything going in. Of course. And I'm like, yeah, there's no way. You know, I'm tough. I'm strong. You know, I, I keep my emotions suitably suppressed for me. <laughs> and it was, it was not good. But then I ended up going in there and I don't believe it's going to work. And the therapist is going back and forth. And she's like, describing this. Please describe the situation to me up front. Put yourself there. And I'm like, okay, I'll do it. Right. Or whatever. Um, I'll tell you what. I, I don't know what happened. Uh, but I will tell you that something came out from like the depths and it was like waterworks central and I'm mm -hmm. sitting there like this is not happening. I have no control over this. I feel very vulnerable. Don't judge me. Right, exactly. <laughs> but she's like, this is unbelievable. And I'm like, I, I did not believe it was going to work. I was so suspect going in and I will tell you that EMDR treatment was like nothing I ever experienced. It was like a cleanse. And I've still got to go back and do more because mm -hmm. uh, I've got a lot of different experiences. <laughs> Level, that are, there's levels to this. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, that, there's many levels to this. But that treatment alone, um, for me, life-changing. Folks, I, I don't I don't know what the, the acronym for EMDR is, but when Dave was mentioning something going back and forth, EMDR is not a drug, but it feels like one once you go through it. <laughs> like, I don't know how EMDR is able to extrapolate things from the brain and take you back to your like literally put your body back into an instance when you were a kid but uh do your own research on emdr if if, if you know you're not trying to take a bunch of meds because the va will throw you a bag full of skittles but let's let's continue to talk more about you you've done the emdr you're you've made changes oh, yeah. um you've addressed I'm not gonna say a lot of things because I don't know your past, but I know mine. Some things I can say, you know, I've addressed some things. But you also mentioned that the acknowledging the change and and staying with the change that's a lifelong process. It is not. Oh, Absolutely. I have PTS. Now I'm done. Yeah. So what does what does life look like for you now as you continue to acknowledge um, your past experiences? For me, um, it's all about sustainment these days, and you know I want to continually progress and, and heal. Uh, it's going to be a lifetime of healing, mm -hmm. but things that I do uh, that make my life better, uh, transcendental meditation, uh, I have not been doing enough, but two times a day at like 23 minutes each, once in the morning, once in the evening helps a lot. Uh, physical fitness, whatever works for you. For me, yeah. I like weight training. Uh, my knees are too bad to go out running anymore, uh, but you know, Doing things that give you fulfillment, like volunteerism. Oh, man, that's huge. So, well, let's let's hold the thought on yeah. volunteerism. Yeah. But we got about ninety seconds. Let's talk about your gardening. Uh, <laughs> gardening <laughs> is another thing for me. I love. Yeah. Um, I learned how to garden in the desert. Mm. Completely different than any other environment, but you create micro environments. Right. Um, I learned that from a, a really good friend of ours, the Spangolas, Betty Spangola, um, okay. who is uh, really good to us. But she taught me how to garden in the desert. Got East it. Coast is easy. You can plant anything. Well, yeah, and it grows. grows. You don't have to have a green Here, thumb. Here, in the valley, you got to be good. <laughs> you have to bring skill. Right. But it's therapeutic. You can mm -hmm. you can actually see something through through its life cycle and watch it grow and prosper, and that's very fulfilling. That is. That is. Thank you for sh for sharing. I was gonna bring. 
you do ride motorcycles. I'm not yeah. going to bring it up because that is something I am extremely passionate about, uh, and we could talk about that for hours. But real quick, what kind of Harley do you have? I've got a couple. Uh, oh, okay, I'm, what's your favorite? My, well, okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's complicated. I have a 2006 Road King I love. Okay. I love it for different reasons, but I have, two, I have a 2012 Street Glide, oh. and I've got really comfortable old manish. Yes. Because that fairing, you can just go forever and ever. Right. And ever. Yeah. It like makes it, it very comfortable. <laughs> I like it. When you were assigned to the A team, like, I mean, was there a part of like, that child aspect of you? Like, I'm part of the A team. Oh, yeah. I was looking for B.A. Barack. Right. Where exactly. is the man? Exactly. Now, which character did you identify with the most? Don't say Murdoch. No, no definitely not Murdoch. <laughs> um, you know, I liked Hannibal because he. Okay. I like the planning aspect of it and his cool, calm demeanor. Right. Throughout. Plus yeah. the cigars. I mean, you can't yeah. go wrong. Love it when a plan comes together. Yeah, I love it when a plan goes yeah. together. All right. Um, we, we've 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 covered a lot, and and I briefly brought up. Yes, you do the uh, gardening thing that kind of takes your mind away. Um, but there's something else that you do that you were doing, and it it escapes my uh, my uh, mind. There's something else that you do to continue this this path of of growth and development within self. Yeah, there, there's a lot um, that I do. I'm I'm busy, as my wife describes me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the education piece, constant uh, self-improvement type things you got to look at. You know, going back to get the MBA was one. Right. Um, I write articles. I like writing thought pieces. Okay. Uh, I did one about Afghanistan. Whole separate topic, but, you know, I'm, I'm not pleased with the with the way that kind of turned out, unfortunately. Right. Um, uh, transcendental meditation is another thing I do. Weight training, uh, like the physical fitness aspect, and the volunteerism and kind of guest speaking. Volunteerism. I let's, do. I love that. Let's let's talk about that, and we're going to talk about it because I bring it up all the time. If if you're dealing with depression, go volunteer because Absolutely. somebody's life sucks <laughs> way more than yours. I'm not saying compare your life to theirs, but there's this thing that just happens with your heart when you don't have to think. What does it do for you? What type of type of volunteerism? Have you done this just kind of been changing for you? Yeah, I'll tell you, perspective is a is a key ingredient to gr gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't fully be gratitude and to, or fully have gratitude and, until you understand your situation and what you're experiencing in life until you see somebody else. And it adds right. that just perspective. And I'll tell you, some of the things that I've done that have been incredibly rewarding is, you know, I like the public speaking thing. I, I, I public spoke for Veterans Heritage Project mm -hmm. here in the Valley. They're great. Um, I worked with the um, some other veterans groups that ended up supporting folks with PTS so they could go to uh, PTS treatment here in state. Mm. And there's a place called Warrior's Path in Arizona that's another alternative and program for folks with PTS. And we worked with a couple of the congressional offices and got approval for a pilot program to add additional funding into this to, to actually pay for veterans to go. Wow. And uh, the Arizona Veterans Medical Leadership Council is here. Uh, there's some great Americans in there, and they were a catalyst to this. Okay. They have the relationships with the offices and state decision makers and getting them on board so they can have an appreciation and understanding that, hey, we can make a difference in these people's lives and actually literally save a life. Uh, so that, that was huge. And, you know, I, I don't know if you, anybody out there has seen it, but they've also separately done an incredible initiative, especially with COVID. Um, and I wasn't involved in this personally, but mm -hmm. seeing them do this, helping the Navajo Nation right. up north okay. uh, with supplies throughout COVID because they were very badly affected by it. Right. Um, was just, it's just a beautiful thing. And it's things like that, um, that that fulfill me and, you know, activities that, help other people and there's so many avenues and so many different ways that you can seek this out it's not hard to find but you have to seek it you have to I mean, seek you it. have to seek you it. gotta get off your gluteus maximus and, and look <laughs> right you is and you have to acknowledge <laughs> we're on the other side of this and we can laugh and say you have to acknowledge but uh, what advice would you give the civilian spouse or the family member or the friend that not sure how to approach because I knew my my wife didn't approach me for a while because she was not sure she she wasn't there when I served we've only been, been married for six years so she wasn't sure how I would respond and she went to college for this but what advice do you have for those family members that know they need to get help for a person but they don't know how to 
how to start that process? All right, this is that's a great question, and I will tell you from a spouse's perspective, who's on the receiving end from their loved one, who's acting so erratically, mm -hmm. you know, suffering in plain sight, right, or suffering silently, but they mm -hmm. know something's off. I would say, you know, you you can try the direct approach. A lot of times that will go unheard because they will deny that they have a problem 99.9% .9 of the times. The best way uh, that worked for, for me is getting the friends on board mm. and getting that network and, and having them engage and them, you know, hey man, you come with me. Um, and it's, it's sad because we lose folks on a daily basis Correct. to suicide. And a lot of these deaths could have been avoided if if somebody reached out to them and, you know put them in a either a literal arm bar right. or you know figurative arm bar and brought them over to the VA for treatment or brought them over to you know whatever got them into a program because um, a lot of times when, when we see this folks will suffer in silence mm -hmm. they'll be struggling internally and the biggest issue is it'll come out in spurts like off gassing and it'll either their behaviors will either indicate like anger uh, depression, anxiety, you know, the hypervigilance, all that kind of stuff. And that can be hell on a loved one. That can be hell on the people that care about them the most, especially if they become withdrawn or chronic, uh, or if they, not chronic, but if they uh, start substance abusing uh, to keep the pain away. To mask that. Yeah, to mask it as a, as a way to just keep that everything depressed because they don't want to work through it. Because if you work through it, you feel it. And if you feel it, it's hard and it's, it's very uncomfortable and painful. But it's so much better than the alternative. Now, I understand that you mentioned that it took you a decade to address it, but I know there's some some years that we don't know that we have it. We think, yeah, I'm doing 165 miles on my motorcycle, and an hour is not like that's. I'm good at it. I'm I'm, I'm fine. I don't. I sleep for 45 minutes in spurts. That's normal. I'm fine. Yeah. These are signs that the 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 average vet coming out doesn't that all their buddies do this oh yeah so yeah i'm up at 2 a.m i went for a five mile run not a big deal i'll go back to sleep and i wake up and do it again what are some some signs yeah. if you're talking to a soldier now that they might want to pay attention to and that's a that's a great point and you know not only for soldiers that are out but also for commanders and you know commit for folks that are still active duty mm. like what to look for people have pattern behaviors we Correct. all do whether we want to or not that's who we are hardwired as human beings and there's things that may that we may do that may like a heart rate monitor oh a blip just came up that that was that was a little different he normally doesn't do that or he, re he reacted pretty viscerally and he does he's normally kind of a calm cool collected type guy mm -hmm. or it's it's those subtle things and sometimes it can be quite overt like, okay like a you know Probably not at home. It could happen at the office. Got it. The explosive temper, mm. uh, and that's all that emotion coming out that they've been trying to suppress. And now Oops. some minor <laughs> thing set it off, yeah. and there they go. Um, you know, the road rage while driving. Yep. That's one thing. I mean, there's there's some great drivers in Phoenix, and then there's some not so great. Drivers. <laughs> of course, exactly. And, um, how do how do they respond to that, or do they re just react to it? Uh, Hyper vigilance. Are they? Do they always have to sit in the corner of a room? Maybe it's their training. Maybe it's something else. But it's knowing it's you have to know your your loved one, or if you're in command, or if you're a friend, you know your you know your friends. You know how they behave. That makes so sense. So you just got to look for those subtleties, and sometimes it could be overcompensation, like the um, you know using the alcohol as a as a coping mechanism. Got it. And yeah, it's okay to have a couple beers. It's okay, whatever. But then when it's too much there's an mm, issue. And if right. it's too much all the time, then there's a big issue. And that can create deteriorate, deterioration like those effects that'll just, yeah. Nice. I, well, one, I thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, everybody that sits across from this desk, um, I've had some pretty high speed guys here. They're, everybody's not comfortable sharing or talking about it. So thank you very much. But let's 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 transition into your business. I mean, you, you're, you're obviously successful. You're, you have a, I don't know your business in and out, but what is your your business in short and 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 what's next with Dave Kluge? Well, I'm I'm actually courting a couple opportunities right now. Okay. Um, I I've, I've been blessed with opportunities, mm -hmm. so that's not a bad thing. And now for me, it's a matter of choosing a direction in which way I want to go. Okay. Um, my wife my wife is a superstar. Uh, I married up 
I think most of us did. We yeah. all did. Yeah, <laughs> we all did. And Man, I don't know how she puts up with me, but she does. I, I was clearly wearing the mask and tricked her at that <laughs> right, time. Right, exactly. Um, but for me, you know, I, I'm weighing what it is that I want to truly pursue. I've, I've been in the, the Special Operators Transition Foundation for a while. Got some great executive counseling, coaching, mm -hmm. mentorship, guidance, um, and it's it's holistic. And that has been very beneficial for me. And now I'm down to really two great opportunities. I want to share them because I don't know which one right. I'm going to choose. Right, of, of course, of but, course. But I will say that um, I got these opportunities through relationships. Of course. Everything's based on relationships. You could have the best resume in the world. Mm -hmm. You could have all the experience in the world and be the most articulate, dynamic, value-added person there is. But unless you know somebody that knows somebody that has a decision or a gatekeeper, right. good luck. Because <laughs> that, that's what I, I discovered in my transition. Okay. Um, I will tell folks, I, I would suggest um, if there's a company or if there's something that you're passionate about and you want to do it, uh, find somebody that works there and, and start networking hard. Mm -hmm. um, blindly submitting your resume and expecting anything is insanity. Uh, it, could, it, it could work. It could. I, I would say that it more likely will not. Higher levels, it, it does not work. It is literally, hey, I know this guy. I mean, what? So I read Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence that's People. A, that, that's amazing. That's and I read that once a year for five years, and it helped me promote. It helped me do a lot of things that I probably there's other people that are maybe better suited for the job. What was the key trigger or or, or factor that helped you realize? Oh shoot, this networking thing is like gold. Well, for me, I, you know, somebody accused me of networking being my superpower, and it, it's just something that I've always enjoyed doing. I, I really enjoy people, mm -hmm. like, and everybody has something great to offer. I love feedback. I love the different perspectives. So for me, that networking piece was really part of my DNA. But okay. what wasn't part of my DNA was actually asking for That's anything, hard. asking for help, <laughs> exactly. asking for whatever it may be, like. For me, that was that was extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. I can do this. I got it on my own. Right? No, no, you, you, you really don't. don't. Takes takes a village. Takes a network. <laughs> it does, and it's, it's interesting that you say that you actually like people. I tell my audience all the time: the five closest people to you act like you, look like you, think like you, believe like you, and sound like you. You'll never grow. And it wasn't until my early thirties that I started finding interest in people that did not have my life experience, and I you learn so much. And then you're the only one like them in their network, and then they. They, they introduce you to people and you, you grow and you go and people, folks understand, people are very interesting. If you can look at them with, I'm not, I'm not going to say rose colored glasses, but remove the negativity away from that. Just look at them without judgment. And you have obviously done a lot. You've probably lived a couple different life lifetimes compared to the say average, even above average person. What are some words as we wrap up? What what advice would you give to not just the veteran, but the person that wants to make a change in their life for the better? You know, I, I've got a I've got a, some close friends, and I see <clears throat> some amazing things, and I and I try to learn from everybody. And what I would suggest, and you know, what I'm and, and my wife even told me this. She's probably the smartest person I don't listen to ever. <laughs> um, I need to start listening more. Uh, is find something you're passionate about mm -hmm. and pursue it in earnest and, and do the things that you need to do to achieve that goal because if you're just kind of getting by or doing things that aren't fulfilling you then you're not fully living life you're not experiencing life as it could be and and, and be make yourself vulnerable is the other thing um, I lived for years trying to be very controlling and guarded right. And when I let, when I threw my pride away mm -hmm. um, and just allowed myself to feel and, and make myself vulnerable and communicate right um not in a in a manner in which would resonate with others you don't want to overshare but, <laughs> of course but, of course but that was something that was that was life-changing for me i love it so one thank you very much dave i appreciate your words of wisdom your time folks i'm dom Fawcett. we're in studio with dave Kluke, united states army uh, Special Forces Green Beret, but so much information. Make sure you rewatch the show. Uh, take notes if you need to. And until next time, you guys have a fantastic day, and we'll see you on the other side.